In the morgue, intending to adjust the pillow in the coffin, the attendant noticed something peculiar about the wealthy lady. And upon touching her hand, almost daily, Nathan repeated the same route from home to work and back. Most of his neighbors didn't know where exactly the guy worked, but businessman Jeffrey Morgan insisted that he was either a loader or a day laborer. No unlikely doesn't seem like it. Loaders often drink and curse, though it's not certain. And that one, always well-groomed and never seen tipsy in public, objected his wife. In reality, Nathan worked as a sanitation worker at the city morgue. It's not the most glamorous job and not everyone's cup of tea, but it suited him just fine. After all, it's only in movies that they show morgue employees eating in the autopsy room and behaving as if they're in a cafe or a cafeteria. But in reality, it's not like that at all. Cleanliness and disinfection are the keys to safety for any employee of such an institution. But Nathan preferred not to talk about it. After all, rumors about the kingdom of death behind four walls weren't the most pleasant. It's understandable. It's human nature to be mistaken about things one doesn't understand. Since the morgue building was located on the opposite side of town, Nathan had to take the bus there every day. The driver, a kind man around 60, always greeted him, mistaking him for a medical worker. Nathan was just too neat and well-mannered. To pass the time on the journey, Nathan always read books on surgery, which meant something. And the driver also knew that Nathan got off at the very stop where the hospital complex and the city morgue were located. But he could hardly guess that his passenger worked as a sanitation worker in the kingdom of death, where an ordinary person would feel uneasy. The main job involved preparing bodies for autopsy and subsequent restoration to a suitable condition for burial. Nathan's colleague in this arduous profession was a 35-year-old sanitation worker named Dylan. They often argued about various issues but invariably made up, understanding the futility of such disputes. Dylan always had a practical view of life and liked to make extra money on the side. Nathan, on the other hand, never took money from the deceased's relatives and managed with his own earnings only. It's not right. People have already lost a loved one. Why profit from it? There's a salary and not a small one, and it's paid on time, no complaints there. During one shift, Nathan also worked with the pathologist Aaron Foster. He was a tall man in his 40s with a small beard and intelligent gray eyes. He loved his job, and considering it extremely important, always repeated, uh, it only seems that those who failed in surgery become pathologists. Oh no, it's not like that. Our work requires specific knowledge, ones that aren't found in any other branch of medicine. Nathan generally agreed with his colleague and respected everyone who dedicated their lives to this profession. Recently, Mr. Foster had become withdrawn and silent, rarely engaging in conversations and increasingly staring out of the window. Everyone was left to speculate about what had happened to the once lively man. Some said he was ill, others that he was tired of work and wanted a vacation. As always, the ever-present janitor, Dylan, had the answer. He took out a loan to buy a country cottage, a heavenly place, I tell you. Everything would have been fine, but just a month after that, his spouse fell seriously ill. It all adds up, Dylan said. Guard Henry shook his head and remarked ironically, and where do you get all this information? Nothing escapes your keen eye. Dylan smiled. One must know how to be observant. Information, after all, is in the air. You just need to grasp it skillfully, and everything falls into place. Nathan was aware of Dylan's abilities, and wasn't particularly surprised that he was aware of everything that was happening. Well, everyone has problems in life. Unfortunately, that's just how it is. Since it was Friday, there wasn't expected to be much work at the morgue, although you can never predict. Nathan knew this better than anyone else. The first half of the day passed relatively calmly, but towards the end of the second half, a wealthy 55-year-old woman was brought to the morgue. It was rumored that she had been actively involved in business during her lifetime and therefore had amassed a considerable fortune. She lived in a country house where the forest and river were within easy reach. Learning that he would have to stay a bit longer for the body's intake, Dylan immediately became nervous. Oh great, why do I get this joy and at the end of my shift, Hey, Nate, can you manage without me? It's a trivial matter. 
No autopsy, they say, and the coffin is ready, just delivered. Well, I'll help you a bit, and then I'm out. Nathan immediately understood what his colleague was aiming at. He probably placed another bet on the catalyst and now rushed home to watch the match live. Go ahead, Dylan, I'll manage. If anything, the guard will help. Why such a rush, especially without an autopsy? Nathan asked. A satisfied smile spread across Dylan's face. Well, I'm not sure, but it seems like the deceased's husband came by and had a long conversation with our pathologist about something. Why the need for an autopsy? Everything is already clear. A heart attack. Complaints about it were already there. The fiancé will obviously be much younger, at least ten years younger. Nathan was satisfied with his colleague's response. What's the big deal? If the pathologist said to prepare the body for burial, then we'll prepare it. Our job is small, as they say. Soon Dylan left, leaving Nathan alone in peace. No, he didn't feel any fear, not at all. And why would he fear when he faced death manifestations daily? By now, the woman's body had already been placed in a coffin, which struck Nathan with its costliness, although, according to the sanitation worker himself, there was nothing to admire in such cases, as the coffin was simply the main funeral attribute, without which no funeral could be complete, excluding cremation, of course. The coffin stood on a small pedestal illuminated from above by the bright light of a lamp. The deceased's facial expression was peaceful, it seemed as though she was asleep and all it would take was to break the silence of the room for her eyes to open immediately. Strange somehow, usually the skin tone is completely different, but then again, the doctors have already confirmed death. What's the point of these musings, Nathan thought? He didn't feel like playing detective right now, and what was the point when it was already clear that the morgue was the end of the line? From here, it was straight to the cemetery. Trying to adjust the deceased's body, Nathan noticed that the small pillow under her head had shifted and it would be proper to fix it. Nathan always respected those who had passed into the other world, so he always did his job exceptionally well and even a bit more. Bending over the deceased, the sanitation worker carefully slipped his hand under her head and adjusted the displaced pillow. They're much better, Mrs. Adams, Nathan whispered, having examined the accompanying documents beforehand. Acute heart failure. What doubts could there be? Everything was clearly and plainly stated in the medical report, but something still didn't sit right with Nathan, making him peer into the face of the deceased business lady again and again. What was wrong with her? The skin color, but that's not indicative. Then what? What was the reason? Just as Nathan was about to step away from the coffin, he noticed that the deceased's eyelids twitched slightly. My goodness, what's this now? Echoed in the sanitation worker's mind. The young man looked closely, but the deceased's face remained impassive. Or maybe it was a trick of the mind. It happens sometimes when consciousness conjures up images of things that aren't there in reality. A minute passed, then another. Nothing happened in the autopsy room. Well, that's it. You're a fantasizer, Nathan, just a regular fantasizer, the sanitation worker said disappointedly. But then the eyelids of the deceased business lady twitched again, and the sanitation worker realized the mistake was ruled out. The woman was clearly alive. Nathan immediately tried to feel her pulse on her wrist, and there it was, a miracle. There was a pulse, weak, barely noticeable. But the main thing was that it existed. And then the woman, lying in the coffin, emitted a faint gasp, and her face slowly began to flush. There was no need to be a genius to understand that the resurrected woman was suffocating. Thoughts raced through Nathan's mind at a furious pace. Urgent action was needed before the unfortunate woman suffocated and departed to the otherworldly realm, now permanently. Nathan's hands trembled as he first considered tracheotomy, a relatively straightforward procedure to restore the airway. However, there was one significant but in all of this. Nathan wasn't a surgeon and had only held a scalpel in his hand a few times in his life, but time didn't allow for contemplation and planning every move in advance. Certainly he could call an ambulance, but the only phone available was at the security post and Nathan never brought his smartphone into the surgical ward. By the time he made the call and the resuscitation team arrived, precious time allotted for the only correct solution would be lost. Come on, you can do it. You've read about it so many times in the textbook, Nathan encouraged himself. 
He then took a clean scalpel, sterilized it with disinfectant solution, and found a suitable tube. With precise movements, he made a barely noticeable incision in the trachea area. The paramedic's heart pounded wildly as air rushed out of the lungs with a noise, and the woman breathed through the tube, intermittently and inconsistently, but still breathed. This was definitely a victory. Nathan rejoiced, ready to jump for joy as if he were a little boy who had achieved something special for the first time, like an adult. What happened next seemed more like a dream than harsh reality. Rushing to the security post, Nathan began calling everyone he could, wanting to gather as many people as possible to help the victim. The paramedic understood. A fatal mistake had occurred upon the arrival of the body, but he was not to blame for it. When a team of resuscitators arrived at the city morgue, the woman was still unconscious, as if unable to decide whether to stay on this earth or depart to another realm. Seeing Nathan's skillfully performed operation, the doctor gave him an encouraging pat on the shoulder. You're amazing, kid. Are you studying to be a surgeon by any chance? No, I'm just a paramedic. I graduated from medical school and worked in surgery for a bit before transferring here, the boy replied modestly. The doctor winked at him and gave him a thumbs up. If only all paramedics in the country could do such things. As it turned out shortly after, Emily Adams was indeed alive, but despite all signs of vitality, she remained in a coma. Doctors speculated on what exactly caused such a reaction in her body. Of course, as is customary in such cases, a whole battery of tests and analyses was conducted. But all of this took time, and the businesswoman's treatment was needed right now. You've outdone yourself, Nathan. Can you believe it, bringing back a wife from the dead? Oh, why didn't I stay with you yesterday? Dylan dreamily mused. Nathan smiled sheepishly. Well, what did I do, really? Noticed her eyelids fluttering, and the rest was just technique. Pathologist Aaron Foster looked disapprovingly at his subordinate, but refrained from commenting. He certainly appreciated Nathan for his reliability, but in this particular case, everything turned out quite the opposite. And he just had to stick his nose where it doesn't belong. Well, maybe it's for the best, but now there's definitely trouble brewing with this rich woman's husband, the pathologist thought sadly. The thing was, upon the arrival of Mrs. Emily's body at the morgue, Mr. Emily's spouse immediately demanded a meeting with Mr. Foster. Initially, the specialist was skeptical about such an event. Who knows what the subordinates might think? They might even take him for a corrupt official, but he was not like that at all. However, when Nicholas Adams entered his office, he made it clear right away that he was used to getting everything from life. Good day, Doctor. I'm here on a particular matter. Son, excuse me, but I'm a pathologist. Doctoring is from a slightly different area of medicine, Mr. Foster corrected his guest. Yes, yes, of course, I agree, but it's more convenient for me with your permission. So, Doc, I need a small favor, and a generous reward awaits you for it, the guest continued without batting an eye. Well, what can I do for you? You understand the city morgue is a place where assistance is only provided to the deceased, and even then... It's the last kind, replied Mr. Foster. Nicholas pursed his lips indignantly, but he still managed to suppress the aggression within him before continuing. Listen, Doc, to be frank, I know about all your problems, your sick wife and the bank loan too. So what's the point of this conversation? If we're being honest, I'm willing to clear all my obligations to the bank, but in exchange I ask you not to perform an autopsy on my wife, all right? The commission won't object. Her heart was sick, you understand. The pathologist pondered. Aaron's first thought was to throw this impudent man out. Who does he think he is? But then, weighing all the pros and cons, he realized that there was some sense in these words after all, so it was worth listening more attentively. Essentially, nothing terrible would happen. The deceased was 55, still relatively young, of course, but by this time, the businesswoman's heart was far from what it was in her youth. Aaron found it difficult to decide not to perform the autopsy. Such cases don't happen every day. And if it weren't for his wife's illness and their dire financial situation, he would never have even considered such a thing. But now there was simply no other choice. If only he had known it would turn out like this. But what's the point of dwelling on it now? As long as nobody found out, let it be as it may. Meanwhile, 
Nathan knew nothing about the agreement between the businessman and the pathologist, so he didn't dwell on it too much. Well, a small miracle happened within the walls of the morgue, but does that mean he should shout about it to the whole world? Nathan saw nothing heroic in his actions and wanted everyone to forget about him as soon as possible. The shift with Dylan's whining seemed endless. As usual, he had lost big yesterday and now complained that he definitely couldn't make it until payday. Hey, Nate, could you lend me some cash? Of course, with interest, how else? And if you don't believe me, let me sell you something. What do you need? Nathan smiled. He had heard such conversations many times before because Dylan was simply addicted to gambling and was willing to go to any lengths for a promising bet. Nathan was short on cash and he didn't want to give his colleague his last bit. Dylan sensed Nathan's hesitation and desperately searched for new arguments to persuade him to lend him the necessary amount. How about I sell you a puppy? Consider it a gift. He's purebred, at least 70%. His dad was a Great Dane, and my Roxy fell for this little guy, so are you taking him? I don't need him. Can't feed two, Dylan persisted. A puppy? Well, that's a good idea, but money's tight for me. I need to make ends meet myself, Nathan said uncertainly. Oh, come on, we'll manage. Just don't doubt. Come on, give what you have, and take the little troublemaker. There's just one male left. Don't hold back, brother. I'd give him away for free if it were your birthday or something like that, Dylan insisted. In the end, the desire to have a puppy outweighed everything else. Nathan had loved animals since childhood and always tried to help them whenever he could. On his way to school, he always carried a biscuit in his pocket for his homeless friends. He'd stop, divide it between two or three, and then head off to school. Naturally, there wasn't enough for everyone, but Nathan didn't worry, and the next day, he fed those who missed out on the crunchy treat. He never knew his parents and lived alone with his grandmother, Rose, a thrifty woman, she never threw away stale bread, but dried it on an iron tray in the oven. This made the tastiest biscuits. Rose always gave the crumbs to the birds, making sure to refill their feeders. Animals are our friends, grandson. Imagine if there were no birds, sparrows, for example. What would happen? The world wouldn't change for the better, only for the worse. Next year, caterpillars and other pests would destroy crops and young trees. Cats, even though they're strays, catch mice diligently, Grandma Rose would say, and Nathan would listen intently. As a wise and well-read woman, Rose knew many interesting stories that only she could tell, and she also made pancakes with apple or pear jam. Oh, they were simply heavenly. You'd lick your fingers clean. Even now remembering these treats, the young medic's mouth watered. Since Dylan lived relatively close to the morgue, Nathan decided to walk there to get the puppy. His colleague promised to give him a cardboard box with holes on the sides to make carrying the pet much easier. When Nathan saw the little one wagging his tail energetically, he couldn't help but smile. How could he not take such a delightful creature? Wow, what a handsome little buddy. Come to me, little guy, Nathan whispered and picked up the puppy. The mother, standing a little apart, grumbled darkly, and he saw that Dylan had deceived him, saying that all the puppies had been taken Three more little snouts were reaching for the mother's breast, craving warmth and rest. But why wasn't this puppy eating with all the others? Why was it standing aside, looking at its mother with hungry eyes? Perhaps its unusual color, light gray when all the others were white, was to blame. And Gerda refuses to feed this one, Nate, why she doesn't love him. I can't figure it out. I'll feed the little rascal myself, of course, but I don't recommend you taking him. You'll just waste your money, Dylan explained catching the guest's questioning glance. But Nathan already knew he would take this puppy. He might be different from the others, but he was still a little creature. Didn't he deserve love and warmth? He certainly did. No, Dylan, I'll take this little grey one. He caught my eye right away, Nathan replied, and reached into his pocket for the money. Of course, he understood that his cunning colleague had tricked him again, but the puppy wasn't to blame for that. Look at how he looks at him with those bead-like eyes. Nathan was smitten, no doubt about it. Taking the box with the little buddy in his hands, Nathan said goodbye to Dylan and headed towards the nearest bus stop. The little one behaved calmly, as if he understood that his life was about to change for the better. Peeking through the holes made in the box for air, the puppy grumbled softly, like a little old forest dweller. Don't worry, it won't be long now, we'll take a bus ride soon with a breeze. Nathan teased the puppy through the hole with his finger. 
he had to wait for about half an hour. As it turned out, his favorite bus with the kind driver had broken down, and they had given another bus as a replacement. Letting people go ahead, he boarded the bus last. Holding the box with the puppy under his arm, Nathan paid and only then realized there was only one seat left. He hesitated for a moment, then carefully sat down, hugging the box with both hands. The puppy inside the box snorted cheerfully, then sneezed a few times. Oh, what's that you've got there? asked an elderly man on whose knees his granddaughter sat. A puppy just got him today, Nathan proudly replied. The old man smiled and nodded approvingly. At that moment, the next stop appeared and the bus began to slow down. The puppy in the box squeaked discontentedly. He's not happy, must have enjoyed the ride, Nathan thought. The doors opened with a creak and a noisy group of three slightly tipsy young men burst into the cabin. Ignoring the driver's words about payment, the young men stood in the aisle and looked around at everyone present. Nathan noticeably tensed. In the bus, mostly elderly people and women were sitting, so the guys felt more and more confident. From their appearance, Nathan immediately understood. They were rich kids. Apparently, after another wild party, they decided to reminisce about their childhood and take a ride on public transport. It would have been fine, but their behavior became more and more unruly. The warm interior of the bus made the guys relaxed and they were drawn to adventure. As a target for their malice, they chose a girl who was sitting a couple of meters away from Nathan, shyly looking down and lost in her thoughts. She had a simple scarf tied around her head, which acted on the slightly tipsy rich kids like a red rag to a bull. Hey beauty, what's up with you? Come on, take off that scarf of yours, show us your face. The stranger blushed and shook her head negatively. Oh, come on, why not? You're a looker, I swear. What, are you shy or hiding something? Probably got horns growing there, the rich kid continued to taunt. His last remark seemed so offensive to Nathan that he involuntarily clenched his fists. But the guys were already unstoppable. Since there was no one to stand up for the girl, Nathan stood up and, handing the puppy to an elderly neighbor, headed towards the trio of slightly intoxicated guys. Hey guys, leave her alone. Be decent. I'm asking nicely. Oh look, we've got a knight in shining armor here exclaimed one of the rich kids with a sneer. Is this the one with the box? What have you got there, buddy? Probably inherited it from grandma, added another. The situation reached its boiling point. Each passenger on the bus felt the threat hanging in the air. The rich kids thirsted for confrontation and slowly approached Nathan. At that moment, the driver made a very sharp maneuver, causing the bus to sway heavily and the tipsy guys fell to the floor together. The moment for Nathan's retribution was irretrievably lost, and the rich kids immediately realized it. The passengers breathed a sigh of relief, and satisfied smiles appeared on their faces. Nathan met eyes with the driver, and instantly realized that he had made the maneuver intentionally to spare him from a fight. Winking at the guy, the driver courteously opened the doors in front of him, as if saying, come on buddy, we'll meet again. There was a noticeable warmth in the young medic's heart, so by standing up for the girl, he did the right thing, and the frozen gratitude in the passenger's eyes was a clear confirmation of that. Although Nathan still had one more stop to go, he decided to get off the bus a little earlier, spurred on by the girl in the scarf, who had done the same thing a couple of seconds earlier. Taking the box with the puppy in his hands, Nathan hurried after her, thinking that if necessary, he would just walk. The stranger turned around and bestowed him with a joyful smile. Thank you. If it weren't for you, I don't even know how all of this would have ended, she said, adjusting the scarf on her head. Nathan blushed and still clutching the box in his hands, replied, Oh, come on, it's nothing. Anyone would have done the same in my place. Those scoundrels are only strong in a group. When alone, they scatter like a handful of jackals. What do you have in your box? the girl asked. Nathan hesitated for a moment then removed the lid and showed her his little friend. Wow, what a handsome fellow, he'll surely grow up big. Look at those broad paws, remarked the stranger. Nathan nodded, realizing he enjoyed being around her. As he would find out later, her name was Amy. She had come to the city from a village and was planning to find work in the big city. Yeah, it's definitely tough to find work here. I mean, especially for newcomers. Even though I'm a local, I live in the suburbs in my late grandmother's house. But still, it took a lot of knocking on doors before I found decent work, Nathan explained. What do you do for work if you don't mind me asking? Amy inquired, hopefully. 
Nathan, visibly embarrassed, glanced downward. Admitting to the girl that he worked as a morgue attendant was harder than saying he was a street beggar. Common stereotypes about his workplace spoke for themselves and often turned the listener against the storyteller right from the beginning of the conversation. Well, I work as a janitor in a hospital, he began. Wow, that's not an easy job, but maybe they need janitors there too. I'm willing. You know, mop the floors, clean up, sweep the yard. Amy eagerly seized upon the idea, but Nathan shook his head negatively. No, they're already fully staffed, and besides, it's a small, close-knit team, so you understand. You'd be better off trying to find a job, as a waitress somewhere, or maybe a kitchen assistant in a cafe. That's more suitable for newcomers. You'll have money and they'll feed you if needed. I knew someone who worked like that. It worked out quite well. Nathan quickly changed the subject. They chatted a bit more, feeling a strong sympathy towards each other. According to Amy, she rented a small room a couple of blocks away and was really hoping to find work. All this time, Nathan was itching to ask her about her parents and how they viewed her leaving home. But then he scolded himself, realizing that asking such questions at this stage would be inappropriate, especially considering that he himself had no parents and lived with his grandmother. Finally, it was time to part ways. Amy needed to turn in one direction and Nathan in another. At that moment, he asked, Why do you always wear a scarf? It's not that hot outside right now. Why do you wear it? Despite the question sounding extremely tactless, Amy quickly responded. I have a burn there, you know. When I lived in the village, I helped take care of the cows on the farm. I actually love animals, and cows have always been my favorite. And one day, there was a fire on the farm, and the cows were trapped in the barn. For a moment, the girl seemed lost in thought, as if she were reliving those terrible events from the past. And then what? What happened next? Nathan exclaimed barely containing his excitement. Amy's story definitely struck a chord with him, evoking sincere sympathy in his heart. During the fire, my heart literally bled when I heard the calves mooing so plaintively, as if calling out for help, you know? So, I rushed to save them. I got them all out, but I got hurt myself, Amy said bitterly, pulling her scarf off her head. Only now did Nathan notice the zigzag-shaped crimson scar on her forehead, of course, it could be hidden under a long bang if desired, but Amy wore a completely different hairstyle, hence why she used the scarf to conceal this dreadful mark. Sorry for asking. Just remembered, uh, the rich folks asked you the same thing, didn't they? So, I thought I'd ask too, the guy mumbled sheepishly. No worries, happens all the time. You're not the first to ask. Amy smiled and waved goodbye to him. As if confirming that it was time for the owner to go home, the puppy sitting in the box began to whine, as if saying, How long are you going to stand here? I'm hungry already. What do you have? Milk, porridge? Come on, I'm up for anything. Despite the fact that the puppy was supposed to grow big, Nathan decided to name him Buddy. Now isn't that a fitting name? I'll have my own Buddy, the guy thought, smiling. At home, he laid down a warm bedding for the puppy next to the door, then poured some warmed milk into the bowl. Greedily slurping, the puppy kept trying to climb into the bowl with its front paws, managing to overturn it a couple of times. Easy there, buddy, where's the rush? You're all mine, no one's taking you away, the guy said, realizing that the puppy was being greedy out of unfamiliarity, as he had never eaten so much before. Suddenly someone knocked loudly and distinctly on the door. Now who could that be at this hour, the guy thought irritably. He wasn't expecting any guests, and besides Dylan, there was no one else to come. Is it him again? I just gave him my last bit of money. But when Nathan opened the door, he saw his neighbor Jeffrey Morgan on the threshold. In his hand, he held a fresh issue of the local weekly newspaper dated for today. Usually the businessman preferred to ignore his neighbor, but here he was coming personally. Hey, Nate, I just dropped by. They wrote an article about you in the newspaper, saying you revived some woman yesterday. The whole street is talking about you, Jeffrey said. Nathan smiled awkwardly, then said, No, I didn't save anyone there. That woman, she was alive when she was brought in. She just started choking, so I performed a simple operation. I read about her a lot in the surgery book, so my knowledge came in handy. The businessman frowned, his expression darker than a rain cloud. Well, that's a surprise, I must say. Here I was thinking we could start a business together. You'll stay here at home, attending to sick people, showcasing your various skills, and I'll bring you clients, the ones that pay well. 
Split the profits 50-50, naturally. You see, I'm the one taking the risks in this venture, and you need to drum up clientele if you really have such talent, he said. To say Nathan was surprised by his neighbor's offer was an understatement. No, no, I'll say it again. I'm no wizard or magician, just a regular morgue attendant. There was a mistake, you see. They brought in an unconscious woman and she ended up on my table, but they didn't proceed with the autopsy. Then I happened to notice her eyelids twitching, so I helped her as best I could, Nathan explained. Jeffrey looked disappointedly at his neighbor, then handed him a newspaper and closed the door behind him. A great opportunity to make some money had just crumbled before his eyes. Jeffrey had already been calculating the profits he could make from potentially collaborating with this young miracle morgue attendant. When Nathan returned to the kitchen, he saw that Buddy was already asleep. The puppy had been so tired from the delicious food and warmth that he had fallen asleep just inches away from his bowl, which gleamed clean after being licked by his tongue. Poor little guy must be exhausted. Sleep tight, Buddy. We'll see what the future holds, Nathan whispered and headed to the bathroom. Today had been a tough day and he intended to take a shower and go to bed as soon as possible. Meanwhile, in the intensive care unit of the city's first hospital, a patient named Emily Adams regained consciousness, causing various sensors and devices to beep so loudly that she felt like she was in a room with space rocket launchers. What is this? Where am I and how did I get here? The businesswoman wondered silently. But when Emily tried to say something aloud, a strange rasp emanated from her throat. The culprit was a medical tube inserted into her throat after she had suffered extensive swelling. Shh, calm down, calm down, you need to remain calm, I'll call the doctor, the nurse said, trying to calm the agitated patient. But Emily, silently moving her lips, still tried to explain that she absolutely needed to attend a business meeting where a very important contract would be signed. The nurse just shrugged and hurried off for assistance. Only when the intensive care doctor entered the room did Emily noticeably calm down, resigning herself to the harsh reality. She truly didn't know how she ended up in the ICU. So imagine her surprise when Emily heard that just a few hours ago she had been in the city morgue's autopsy room where she had been brought back to life by a morgue attendant named Nathan. Mrs. Adams, I think you need to approach this situation with a considerable amount of calmness. There's no need for you to rush anywhere anymore. Even if you did want to seal an important deal, it's now too late. First and foremost, you need to recover because being in a coma is extremely dangerous for a person as it essentially represents the body's borderline reaction. Do you understand? The doctor began. Emily sighed with sadness and slowly closed her eyes, indicating that she was very tired. Soon, her husband Nicholas was informed about what had happened in the intensive care unit. To the surprise of the doctors, he said he wouldn't be able to come to the hospital today and would probably only appear tomorrow, closer to the evening. He's acting strange. He was the one shouting to save his beloved wife at all costs, and now he's hiding from her like a little boy, thought the intensive care doctor to himself. Nathan was unaware of all this as no one intended to involve him in such nuances. The next day, he was awakened not by the crack of dawn, but by Buddy's hearty barking, who was hungry and demanding to be fed. Just a moment, just a moment, let me at least open my eyes. You practically slept by your bowl all night long, but I had a bout of insomnia. I tossed and turned all night, only managed to doze off towards morning. Nathan grumbled discontentedly, but after washing his face with cool water and having a cup of coffee, he felt noticeably better, and his eyes opened on their own. Buddy, also having his fill of delicious milk, visibly calmed down and looked at his owner with slightly drooping eyes. All right, you stay the eldest, pal, and I'm off to work. A strong request to behave quietly and not turn the house upside down, although, who am I talking to? Nathan waved his hand. The little one barked agreeably and wagged his tail, emphasizing everything that had been said. Today, on his route, Nathan encountered a familiar driver who, out of a sense of friendship, even saved him a seat next to him. Oh, come on, it was nothing. I just stood up for the girl, what's the big deal? Nathan cautiously remarked. The driver smiled. No, dear fellow, it's not about that. I mean the article in the newspaper. You're quite something. I never would have thought. I always imagined you as a doctor, you know, a surgeon or an orthopedist. And here you are, a sanitation worker. Disappointed, huh? Nathan joked. No, not at all. I respect you even more after this. 
the driver replied enthusiastically. Nathan nodded in agreement, understanding that he wouldn't be able to change the man's mind anyway. He himself had dreamed of becoming a surgeon since childhood when he first watched a movie about people in white coats. Grandma Rose didn't object to this, believing that her grandson should find himself in life, and she just needed to push him in the right direction and support him with kind words. Nathan applied to medical school twice and failed the exams both times, missing only a few points. But the guy didn't blame the examiners for it. I guess it's my fate to become a sanitation worker after medical school, he thought back then, and then came the army and service as a medical orderly in the military unit. He refused the offer of an extended service as by that time, Grandma was already seriously ill and eagerly awaited her grandson's return. As luck would have it, Nathan's demobilization party was delayed by almost three weeks, which meant he arrived home just as Rose was on her deathbed. Meeting the notary at the door, Nathan paled and hastily unbuttoned the collar of his worn-out coat. Rose was still alive, clinging to life with all her might, as if sensing her grandson's return. Grandma, what's happened to you? How did this happen? And why is there a notary here? Nathan exclaimed, barely able to contain his agitation. Rose forced a smile through her suffering and ran her hand over her grandson's head. Forgive me, dear. I fell ill. I feel like I won't recover this time, my grandson. Tears welled up in Nathan's eyes. Grandma, stop it. What are you saying? I'll call the medic. We'll get you on a drip. You can't give up prematurely like this. No, don't break your heart. I feel my time is short. I've wanted to tell you for a long time, but I couldn't gather the strength, Rose said with effort. Nathan looked at her with concern. What was she talking about? In such a state, a person could say many things unrelated to reality. But she continued. You don't know anything, dear. You're not my biological grandson. I'm sorry I'm only telling you this now. I was afraid you'd condemn me. I used to work as a medic and lived in a completely different area. By that time, I had no family left. My son died in prison. My husband perished in a river accident, a tragic accident. So I worked in the local medical center, helping the locals. One night, a woman knocked on my door. How she found me, only God knows. It was dark as pitch, but she was holding her stomach and groaning in pain. It tore at my heart. I looked closer and realized she was pregnant, you understand? And she was already far along, practically ready to deliver. I can tell these things at a glance, but what surprised me the most was the fear in her eyes, as if someone was chasing her, covered in bruises and blood, but she didn't say a word about what happened. Nathan listened silently, holding his grandmother's weakening hand in his palms. Rose continued. So I brought this woman to the medical center. I wanted to treat her wounds, do some basic bandaging, but her water brokey. I had no choice. I delivered the baby. It was a sturdy boy, I remember, weighing 4,800 grams. The woman cried, thanked me for avoiding a caesarean, saying they were planning to operate on her in the city, but she managed without any intervention. I, foolishly, didn't even ask for her surname, and she ran away the next morning. She left her child and ran away, or oh, what kind of mothers are there nowadays? But God will judge her, but at least I had you, my grandson. I quickly resigned from the medical center, changed my name to avoid any trouble, and moved to the city. Your mother, by the way, never showed up. I waited for her in the village for about three months before I started to process the documents for you. So for 25 years I've kept and guarded this secret. Don't worry, I haven't forgotten about you, darling. I've transferred the house to your name and saved up some money for you to start with. Nathan looked into the eyes of his beloved grandmother and felt in his heart how she was slowly fading away. Life was literally slipping away from the frail body of the elderly woman, step by step, bringing her closer to the bottomless abyss. Half an hour later, Rose was gone. Rushing home with joyful news, Nathan involuntarily became a participant in tragic events. The grandmother's funeral and all subsequent mourning events passed for him as if in a dream. Nathan had to go through a lot before he could finally come to himself, Naturally, he couldn't find out anything about his mother. How could he when the past was overgrown with weeds and some of the participants of those events were no longer alive? Nathan changed many jobs before fate brought him to the city morgue. At first, he thought he wouldn't stay here longer than a week, but everything turned out differently. 
In the morgue, Nathan felt calm. Emergencies were rare here and subordinates were almost never shouted at, and today was no exception. As soon as the orderly crossed the threshold of this mournful establishment, he was immediately summoned by the director. What does he need from me, Nathan wondered. The chief gave him an assessing look and then said, Sorry, I'm not offering you a seat, especially since today is your day off. Probably you have some leave days saved up. I do, Mr. Spencer, but why do I need a day off today? I was actually planning to work. The director smiled. Well, man proposes and God disposes, but that's all just poetry. You won't have to work today anyway, and I have a very weighty reason for that. You see, Nathan, Emily Adams wants to see you. You know, the one you recently revived in the autopsy room. Me, but why, Mr. Spencer? Nathan was puzzled. The director just shrugged disappointedly. How would I know, kid? You were called, so off you go. On the way to the first city hospital, Nathan could only think about the upcoming meeting. What would he say to this woman? And what kind of person was she? Authoritative, cruel, or the opposite? Passing through the clinic's lobby, Nathan immediately approached the reception desk and quickly outlined the situation. Yes, I've been informed about your visit already. Mrs. Adams has been moved from the intensive care unit to the therapy department. You need to go to the second floor, room number seven. They'll tell you everything there, the administrator explained with a smile. On shaky legs, Nathan climbed upstairs, where he was met by a therapy nurse. Giving the orderly a gown and shoe covers, she led him to the right room. When Nathan entered, he hesitated in the middle. What a fool he was. Couldn't he at least buy a cheap bouquet of flowers on the way to the clinic? Mrs. Adams seemed to sense his embarrassment and gestured for him to sit beside her. Nathan obeyed. Since speaking was quite difficult for Mrs. Adams due to the tracheotomy, she mostly limited herself to rare phrases, expressing her admiration for Nathan's deed. The orderly listened silently, blushing with embarrassment like a lobster. He definitely liked the praise, even though he didn't like praising himself. But what was there to praise about? He never became a surgeon and only managed to get a job as an orderly in the city morgue. But Mrs. Adams didn't see it that way. Telling her the truth was indeed possible, but she couldn't do it due to partial loss of voice. Fortunately, Emily managed to overcome this problem and hastily scribbled a brief note to the paramedic, summarizing the stories of the recent years of her life. Taking the note in his hands, Nathan unfolded it and began to read. Mrs. Adams's spouse died in a car accident about 25 years ago. Since then, the management of her late husband's business fell entirely on her fragile shoulders. Emily could only remarry at a fairly mature age, at 55. It's not easy to live on, especially when your new husband is 10 years younger than you. She met Nicholas at one of the corporate events held in honor of the upcoming new year. Handsome, with grey eyes and a strong chin with a dimple in the middle. How could one not fall for such a man? No, Emily was never one to swoon over men valuing a clear, level-headed approach in any relationship. Their romance lasted about six months, after which Nicholas proposed to her. Oh, how romantic and sensual it was. A restaurant champagne, a bouquet of roses. At the climax, the orchestra played Emily's favourite melody, and she accepted his proposal. Next came the wedding and a feast fit for a king. They spent their honeymoon in the Maldives and their first anniversary in Bali. Life seemed like an endless fairy tale. Flowers, expensive gifts, attentiveness, and a light sea breeze refreshing their bodies heated by summer heat. The revelation was painful, and at first Emily couldn't even believe it was possible. In an instant, Nicholas turned into a moody man who was irritated by every other word from his wife. Emily desperately tried to fix the situation, but all in vain. It was as if her husband had been replaced. Nicholas often returned home after midnight, leaving traces of women's perfume around him, and secretly talked on the phone, trying to wipe off lipstick marks from his shirt collars. Emily tried to get him to confess, argued and even scandalized, but Nicholas only smiled knowingly, well aware that there was no marital agreement between them. Emily was about to file for divorce, when her husband suddenly backtracked and became as affectionate as before. As it turned out, it was the calm before the storm. The climax came on the day of important negotiations when Emily was preparing to seal the deal of the century. Wanting to support his wife, 
Nicholas bought her an evening gown with his own money and suggested she try it on. It's worth noting that he was skilled at giving gifts and knew his wife's taste perfectly. Oh my, what a beauty! How much did you shell out for this dress? exclaimed a stunned Emily. Don't exaggerate. You deserve the most exquisite things as only they can accentuate your beauty and femininity. Try it on quickly. Let me behold this magnificence. Nicholas skillfully returned the compliment. Emily's cheeks flushed with praise. He always knew how to flatter. Emily immediately put on the gorgeous dress, and only when she was about to zip up the zipper at the back did she feel a slight prick in her forearm. Darling, what's this? Emily asked in a weakening voice, pulling a small needle from her sleeve, its tip bearing a tiny droplet of blood. She couldn't remember anything else, and she finally regained consciousness only in the intensive care unit, having undergone a tracheotomy in the morgue's autopsy room. When the doctors took blood from the wealthy woman upon admission to the clinic, it turned out that there was a considerable amount of plant-based poison in her system. The police puzzled over how it could have entered Emily's bloodstream, but there was still no answer. This continued until Emilia asked the police officer to watch the video from the hidden surveillance cameras she had installed a week before the horrific incident. Nicholas was unaware of them, and it became his downfall, as the video clearly showed him injecting the poisoned needle into his despised wife's dress. The scoundrel's plan was simple. By scratching Emily's skin with the poisoned needle, she would die of cardiac arrest, and he would become the owner of a huge multi-million dollar company. But the hapless poisoner miscalculated, as the poison turned out to be homemade and lacked the deadly potency of the original. Nicholas was arrested on the same day Emily was transferred to a shared ward. A young paramedic learned all this from a detailed letter handed to him by the businesswoman. In the end, Emily asked Nathan to tell her about himself and his life. The young man began from afar, briefly describing his childhood and youth, and then moved on to the present. Emily listened silently, and only when he mentioned the incident with the expectant mother did. She start coughing hysterically. Oh my God, what's wrong with you? Where does it hurt? Should I call a nurse? But Emily waved her hands in protest and asked for a piece of paper and a pen. Then she wrote just one sentence on it. Nathan took the paper in his hands and was literally stunned with shock. E am your mother, Nathan, read the message from the patient lying on the couch. No, no, this simply cannot be, he whispered and grasped his head. Tears streamed from Emily's eyes and her lips trembled betrayingly. Only when Nathan calmed down a bit could she tell him the truth. And it was as follows. Twenty years ago, the young married couple, the businessman Adams, got into a terrible car accident orchestrated by their competitors. Emily's husband died on the spot, and she, being in the last month of pregnancy, survived and hid from pursuers in the forest. After wandering there for several hours, the pregnant wealthy woman emerged at a field hospital where she received help from the late Rose. She couldn't find her son right away because she had to go into hiding abroad from her pursuer's competitors immediately after giving birth. In hindsight, Emily regretted it many times because she only returned home after 15 years and now looked into the eyes of her adult son seeking support. Nathan didn't judge his mother Instead, he knelt down in front of her and leaned his cheek against her hand. Forgive me, son, Emily whispered, overcoming her pain. And you forgive me, Mom. A month passed. When Nathan came to pick up his mother from the hospital, he wasn't alone. He was with his girlfriend, Amy, holding a tiny puppy named Buddy. Their romance had begun right after the incident on the bus, when a paramedic saved her from the attacks of hooligans. Seeing her son, Emily hurried to him, wanting to embrace him in her strong maternal arms as soon as possible. The nurses watching this touching scene couldn't hold back their tears. Perhaps this is true happiness. Thank you for watching till the end. If you enjoyed the story, please support me by clicking the like button. It's just one click for you, but it means a lot to me. Thank you in advance.